Good morning, YouTube. Booktube, this is Johnny. Sitting in my main study, writing in my diary. It is March the 29th, 2020. It is 9.39 here in West Michigan in the mornings. As I sit here in my study, I can hear the wind howling outside. We're supposed to have rain this morning. It's 50 degrees. And yeah, I'm writing in my diary, having devotions. I was reading this morning, Canon, Covenant, and Christology. Rethinking Jesus and the Scriptures of Israel by Matthew Baronet. Yeah, all the churches are closed on this Sunday morning. And um, so my wife is um, listening to, on her cell phone, her associate minister um, on their Covenant PCA Facebook site having a, I suppose, a sermon. And I, was, I was reading this this morning, Wonderful Works of God by Herman Bavick. I, I've shown this, I've been reading this. Today I was reading on the Divine Trinity. Uh, yeah, it's called The Wonderful Works of God, Instruction in Christian Religion. According to the Reformed Confession, this is the a new edition of a book that I had many years ago. Our Reasonable Faith. See why it's called the Wonderful Works of God. This was the original title that, when it was first published in the Netherlands, back in I think it was first published back in the. Well, first it was translated out of Dutch, and this edition came out in copyright 1956 by Erdmans. And this paperback edition, April 1977. But this edition was published by Westminster Theological Seminary, and they put the original title, which was The Wonderful Works of God, and they put in it the original introduction by Herman Bavick. Uh, so, and plus I said it has a scripture index, subject index in the back of it. So I was reading that this morning, but then I, I received in the mail last week, I get these little sermon booklets. I've shown them over the, in the past. I think this is by the... Uh, the Netherlands Reformed Church in Grand Rapids. And this is a little sermon booklet by William Gatsby. Gatsby was, he was born in 1773 and he died in 1844. He was a minister, I think among the strict Baptists, peculiar Baptists. And I have Gatsby's hymnal. I'll show it to you here. This is a little Gapsy's hymnal. When I was in Bible college, let me get my timeline here so I can give you exactly time. My timeline. Okay, here. Uh, I re I went to I left Cal I left Richmond, California in 1978. I was 26 years old to finish college at Grand in Grand Rapids at Reformed Bible College, which is now Kuiper College. So in 1978. So when I was going to Reformed Bible College back there in the late 70s. I graduated from Reformed Bible College in 1981. I was 29 years old. On Wednesday nights, there was a like a, a service at the Strict Baptist Church there in Grand Rapids, and 
that they always sang from the Gapsni hymnal. And I bought one when I was in seminary. And this was by Gapsby. Well, in this is not only uh, hymns by William Gapsby, but other hymn writers are very famous Calvinistic hymn writers. So sometimes I, I quote this in my blogs, my online diaries. But this is a sermon by William Gatsby. And that's what I was going to read a little bit of it this morning. As I, you know, I was sitting here reading it and I thought, hey, I'll just share it with you guys. And the text for this sermon is from 1 Peter 2.9. 1 Peter 2, I've got my little Bible here. 1 Peter 2.9. Uh, let's see here. 1 Peter 2.9. I wanted to read the whole text. It says, um, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who, were once, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So the text is a peculiar people. I think this reason why this is a this is a new King James. So it says, "But you are a chosen generation, a holy nation, uh, so it's a." Uh, the text is a little bit different in the King James and the New King James, but it says a peculiar people. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you may show forth the praises of him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. So I was reading this and I thought I'd just read parts of it. I can't read the whole sermon. But he goes into... Uh, I'd start at section one here. Well, this, I, you know, I was, maybe I'll start at section two. Let me see here. No, I'll just start here. The Lord has set, he, the Lord has set this peculiar people apart for himself in a peculiar and special way. Yea, he has, he has so set them apart for himself as to bid defiance to all the roarings and dreadful powers of hell, and all the bubblings and workings up of sin and pollution, both within and without, to separate this people from God's bosom and, to, and God's heart. His solemn majesty has said when speaking of them, This people have I formed for myself. Now God formed all people, they are all the workmanship of God. But there are few characters set especially apart as a little lot, whom God has ordained to glorify, and to them he says, This people have I formed for myself, and they shall and they shall show forth my praise. Oh yes, says free will, they shall have a choice chance to do it if they will. But God says they shall they shall. Unbelief says you shall not. Cardinal reason says you can't. Inbred corruption says you won't. But when God says you shall, when he speaks the divine shall, it comes with an un invincible energy of the conscience, and that blessed truth is made manifest, that he raises up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill. God could not possibly do this unless the men were first in the dust and on the dunghill. Now what is this dunghill? Why, it is the horrible depravity and the cursed corruption of our filthy nature. And what is that? What is the dust? It is the working up and manifestations of the loathsome particles of guilt and filth in this dunghill. And when God suffers Satan to stir up this dunghill in the conscience of a poor sinner, he finds the dust so overpowering that the poor soul thinks he shall really be suffocated with it 
and never expects to breathe again. Yet all the while God has set this humble has set these humble souls apart for himself, and he will raise them from the dust and off the dunghill, and will set them among princes, even the princes of his people, and he will make them inherit the throne of glory. Now, if you will look at this in connection with the text who named, This people have I formed for myself, you will find there is nothing very amiable said about them. If God compares them to animal nature, he calls them beasts of the field and dragons and owls. Who besides God would have said so? These beasts, these dragons, these owls shall honor me? No one else would. They would have fixed upon something more amiable. But this is God's method. When God compares his people to an animal nature, he calls them a wilderness and a desert. But this desert and this wilderness are to become the garden of the Lord. And these beasts and dragons and owls are to be brought forth manifestly to be a people to praise the Lord. And God says, they shall glorify me. Now I should not wonder what, now I should not wonder but that there are some persons here who would, who would not be called such creatures as these on, on any account. You think you do good. How dutiful and pious you have always been. Perhaps you have been brought up in piety and have received a pious education and hope to continue pious and to all the pleasures of God. Now I tell you what, if God does not burn up your natural religion, if he does not root out your creature piety and make you know that you are vile and filthy, you will never know the, never know the blessedness of God's blessed salvation. You can only know it in the way that, that His gracious majesty pleases you sh should know it. And His way is to show you the horrible state of your own corrupt nature and the oozing up of that fountain of sin that is within you. And when you feel your own wretchedness and utter incapacity, you are by necessity obliged to place your whole dependence on the Lord. You will then trace something of the matchless wonders of God who has chosen you as one of his special people who are formed for himself. They shall, for, they, shall, they shall show forth his praise, and you will know a little what is to be a peculiar people. The doctrine of discriminating grace is not fashionable among a certain body of professors, but is nevertheless true. According to their views, Jehovah himself is the only being in existence who is now allowed to make a choice. To talk of God making a choice and setting apart a people for himself, they say, is, is an unjust God, and the fault of damnation is his. He is not a holy and just God in that case. According to them, God is unjust because he chooses. Yet you will find these very characters vindicated their own right to make a choice in almost every instance. They think they have a right to choose a companion for life, to choose their own food, to choose or reject God. Yet Jehovah has no right to make a choice. He is the only being without that right. Consequently, they sink God lower than the lowest beggar in existence. They make him lower in their estimation than the poorest sinner under the heavens. But when they have used all their arguments and spent all their pride and enmity against God's right to make a choice, he still chooses as he sits on the unshakable throne and in his electing immortal everlasting love chooses a people for himself, a people that shall glorify him and be his portion forever. <coughs> the Lord's portion is his people, and in Jacob is a lot of his inheritance. God did not find Jacob full of pious cultivation with which some persons wish to recommend themselves to God, but he found him in a desert land where no one but the Lord should have looked for him. No one else would have ever expected to find God's gems and jewels in the crown of his rejoicing in a desert land. Oh, what a mercy it is that the Lord comes to seek and save his own. If he had not, if, if it had not been his work, they would never have been found. No one else would ever look for them there. They would have never expected to find them in the low situation in which sin has plunged them. But God knows where to look, and he finds them in a desert land, in a howling wilderness, and after he has found them, what does he do with them? He leads them forth and instructs them in his glorious dispensations. 
He teaches them fresh lessons as long as they shall live and amidst all the bewilderings and dangerous parts of their journey. He keeps them as the apple of his eye. Oh, what a text that is. The apple of the eye is considered to be the most tender part of the human body. And what is the apple of God's eye? It is his own glory. And where is that secure? In the person of the Son of God. There the glory of God is secure so that the Lord keeps those whom he has consecrated and set apart for himself to be a peculiar people as sacred and secure as his own glory and the persons of the God-man mediator, for he keeps them as the apple of his eye. What a blessing it is to be among the number of this peculiar people. So that's a little bit of this sermon by William Gatsby. So it's kind of like if we are the apple of God's eye, if we are his peculiar people, then he loves us, he watches over us, and he will take care of us as we go through this this pandemic. So, you, so, so, like I said, I'm reading the Holy Bible, reading this sermon by William Gatsby, writing on my diary. I'm on page 326 for the year 2020. It is a Sunday morning. It's going to rain here in West Michigan. And uh, we're all doing okay here. We're kind of holed up here. I don't know anybody who's sick yet in our family. And yeah, so I hope you're all doing well. Thank you for the new subscribers. Thank you for the comments. Uh, this is, we're coming to the end of March, going into the month of April. Hopefully things will get better. That, uh, but all we can do is pray and wait. So I suppose I'll just sign off. I just want to stop by and say hello, read you a little bit from that sermon by William Gatsby. And uh, yeah, like I really like these hymns. Uh, yeah, it says, Selection of Hymns for Public Worship by William Gatsby. It's a little... So... Yeah, sometimes I look through this so I'll sign off and until next time once again thank you for the comments and the subscribers and and yeah hope you have a good reading week that you are all like I said doing well till next time bye